Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So today's talk will be on Jacinta, Saint Jacinta, one of the seers in Fatima. And at the beginning, let's pray the opening prayer composed by the church for the feast day of Francisco and Jacinta. God of infinite goodness, who loves the innocent and exalts the humble, grant that in imitation of Saints Francisco and Jacinta, we may serve you with purity of heart and so be worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's begin with a reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 18. The disciples approached Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child over, placed it in their midst, and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one child such as this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that the angels in heaven always look upon the face of my heavenly Father. At another time, children were brought to Jesus that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked them. But Jesus then said, Let the children come to me and do not prevent them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After he placed his hands on them and he went away. As already said, I dedicate this talk to Saint Jacinda, who was the youngest of the three children. She was in 1916, only six years old, when the angel appeared. <clears throat> Her full name is Jacinta de Mauto, Jacinta de Jesus de Mauto, and she was born on March 11, 1910 and died at the age of nine on February 20th, 1920. <clears throat> February 20th, or her day of death for the saints, that's the day of their birthday for heaven. This is also the feast day of Francesco and Jacinta. So on this day, the church celebrates the liturgical feast of these two saints. They were, were beatified by John Paul II on May 13th, in the Jubilee year 2000, and then they were canonized by Pope Francis on May 13th, 2017. <clears throat> the cause for the siblings' canonization began already in 1946, when the bodies were exhumed, exhumed in 1935. Jacinda's face was found to be completely incorrupt, so that was 15 years after her death. Francisco's body had decomposed. The church long resisted to canonize children. Still in 1937, Pope Pius XI decided that causes for children should not be accepted for canonization because they could not fully understand heroic virtue or practice it repeatedly. So these are essential conditions for canonization that one practice virtue heroically and habitually, not just a few moments or once in a while, but always continually. Now due to this decree of Pope Pius XI, for the next four decades, no sainthood processes for the children were begun. Only in 1979, the Bishop of Leiria Fatima ask all the world's bishops to write to the Pope petitioning him to make an exception for Francisco and Jacinta. And then more than 300 bishops sent letters to the Pope writing that the children were known, admired, and attracted people to the way of sanctity. Graces were received through their intercession. The bishops also expressed that children, the children's canonization was a pastoral necessity 
for the children and teenagers in our times. And indeed, they are the youngest ever canonized children in the church, except the innocent children, but they really don't count. They were, they were uh, slaughtered by Herod when they're still not in the use of reason. So this is a very special case. But the children of Fatima were the youngest ever canonized children in the church. So this is unique. This also tells you something about the importance of the message of Fatima and also that the message of Fatima can people relatively fast lead to great holiness. And therefore, listen to the message of Fatima. It is essential for our time. Then in 1979, so already John Paul II, who was a great devotee to Our Lady, the Congregation for the Causes of Saints held a general assembly, so cardinals, bishops, theologians, experts, they were meeting and debated whether it was possible for children to practice heroic virtue habitually, constantly, and then they came up with a positive recommendation on the basis that there are in fact children, though very few, who have a genius, for example, for music, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, or for mathematics. So in some supernatural way, some children could be spiritual prodigies. And then 10 years later, John Paul II declared Francisco and Jacinta venerable that was in 1989, and this opened now the way for the beatification and the canonization. Most of what we know about Jacinda comes from the memoirs of Sister Lucia, which she wrote for the Bishop of Leria, Fatima. Lucia describes Jacinda as oversensitive, also possessive as, at times. The slightest quell was enough to make her pout in a corner. Jacinda also was very much attached to playing games, to dancing, and to singing. When playing, she herself insisted to choose the kind of game she liked best, and she could hardly endure ever losing. The games she liked best were pebbles, buttons, and forfeits. So I don't know all of them, but maybe you know. Pebbles was the game they played when the angel of Fatima appeared the first time. In spite of these character faults, Jacinda had a very good heart. This is Lucia, she writes, God had endowed Jacinda with a sweet and gentle character, which made her at once lovable and attractive. This is Lucia also recalls that one day when they played forfeits, she, Lucia, lost. In this game, now the loser has to do whatever the winner tells the loser to do. And Jacinta loved to send the loser chasing butterflies to catch one and bring it to her. But one day, and this was one of the key moments in Jacinta's life, they were playing forfeits at Lucia's home, and this time she was losing. So this time it was Lucia who told her what to do. So Lucia demanded that Jacinta would give a kiss to her brother Francisco, who was sitting at the table. But Jacinda then protested, Dead nods, tell me do something other. Why don't you tell me to go and kiss our Lord over there? So there was a crucifix hanging on the wall. And then Lucia said, all right, get up on the chair, bring the crucifix over here, and kneel down and give three hugs and three kisses to our Lord, one for Francisco, one for me and one for yourself. Jacinda replied, To our Lord, yes, I will give as many kisses and hugs as, as you like. And she ran over to get a crucifix and she kissed it and hugged it with so great devotion that Lucia would never forget it. Then Jacinda, she looked very attentively on the corpus of our Lord and she asked, Why is our Lord nailed to the cross like that? Lucia said, because he died for us. And Jacinda then, she wanted to know all what happened. 
So Jacinta, she was listening, she heard of the sufferings of our Lord, related by Lucia. Lucia, she was very intelligent, she was older, and her mother was also a catechism teacher, so she knew the story of our suffering Lord. So she told that Jacinda everything. And from then on, Jacinda often asked Lucia to tell her over and over again the passion of our Lord. And then she would weep and grieve, saying, Our poor dear Lord, I will never sin again. I don't want our Lord to suffer anymore. Just here the side, those who have kids, tell them about the passion because this just will be engraved in their hearts and they will just be inflamed for love of our Lord who suffered so much for each one of us. It's one of the key moments. I also know a, a, a story from a little boy in Fatima, no, in Portugal, close to Fatima. And her mother often talked to the boy about Jesus, no, in scripture, that's what they are supposed to do in the evening. Not watching TV or sports or whatever, but you have to talk about Jesus first of all, pray together the rosary, make sure Christ is the center. So this mother often talked to the boy, and the boy was just in love with Jesus, and often in a special devotion to the crown of thorns. And he would often stand before the crucifix and just, you know, meditate and contemplate our Lord. Then one day his grandma died, and he loved his grandma so much. It was a huge pain for him. What did he do? He went to the crucifix, stood there for five, few, five minutes or so, and then he came back and said, now it's okay. Now he could relate, you know, grandma's death to Jesus. Jacinta had also an immense hunger and desire for Holy Communion. She would have done everything to receive Communion, but she was too young. Lucia herself was admitted to Holy Communion at a very early age, comparatively at that time. I think in Portugal, the time to receive Communion, communion I'm not sure, but I know, generally speaking, uh, children were allowed to receive First Communion in some areas with 10, at the age of 10, others 12, even 14, so relatively late. I don't know exactly the time, I think it was, it was maybe 10 years, I'm not sure. In any case, but also Lucia had a tremendous desire to receive Communion. She often, she knew the Catechism perfectly because of her mother, and her greatest desire was to receive Holy Communion. And she knew the Catechism better than all the older kids. And then she would ask the priest that she would be allowed to receive early Communion. And the priest said no. And she was so devastated and there was a very saintly priest who would go from village or town to town, Father Cruz. And I think there's also uh, process going, they want to declare him venerable and then saint of course. And he would go through these villages and when he was arriving in Fatima, then he was one day hearing confessions. And Lucia, she didn't dare so much to go to his, her parish priest to go to confessions. So she went to Father Cruz and she wept and wept and wept and just poured out her heart how much she would like to go to, conf uh, to receive communion. And then Father Cruz, he asked her question, you know, and he verified she's prepared. And then she, he went to the priest, to the parish priest, and said, I take the responsibility, there's no problem, you can give her communion. And so she received this special grace to receive early communion. And it was also a response to the decree of Pius X. Just in 1915, so at that time, he gave out his decree, Quam Singulari, where he allowed early communion for children, and this should be really fostered also in our parishes. He simply states in this document that if a child can distinguish between normal bread and the Eucharistic bread, and has a desire 
to receive our Lord in the Eucharist, then the child can receive. So if you ask the child, who is this in the friend in the monstrance? The child says, it's Jesus. Would you like to receive him? Yes, you can receive him according to the degree. And the Pope said, how many harms, how many attacks of the devil, how many sins could have been avoided in the past if you would have children allowed to go to the table of the Lord earlier? Because children, they are pure, innocent, and our Lord can impress his own image into their souls much more easily when they are young and innocent. But today already with six, five years, what children are being confronted with, with, a, with, a, with mud and dirt and sinful stuff in television everywhere around. And then when they are nine years or 10 years old, they receive communion, their souls are already devastated, many kids. So the earlier a kid goes to communion, the normally better. Of course, it needs to be properly prepared. Some kids can receive even with four years of age. They can already distinguish normal bread from the Eucharistic bread. So Jacinta, she had also this immense hunger for the Holy Eucharist. And she wanted to receive our Lord that Lucia did. Lucia, however, told her that she cannot receive Jesus because she did not know, know enough of the catechism. So Jacinta and Francisco asked Lucia to teach them catechism, and they learned with extraordinary enthusiasm. The two children desired most ardently to receive, they called him always, the hidden Jesus. Jacinta never stopped asking questions about the hidden Jesus, and one day she asked Lucia, how is it that so many people receive the little hidden Jesus at the same time? Is there one small piece for each person? It's a good question, huh? I tell you today, probably 90% of Catholics would not be able to answer the question. Lucia replied, not at all. Don't you see that there are many hosts and that there is a child Jesus in all of them? Of course, that's nonsense also. <laughs> and then you better don't copy this answer. So Lucia remarks herself afterwards, what a lot of nonsense I must have told her. So I mean, it's, it's not so easy to answer. No? Theologians, they can explain that very uh, yeah, with great foundation. It's the same Jesus. In the year 1916, they pastured together the sheep of their two families. So it was Lucia's families and the Marto family. When they were out in nature, they loved to sing. The Portugal has a huge amount of popular songs, often religious songs, Jacinta's favorite hymns were Salve Noble Patrera, that means Hail Noble Patroness, or Virgin Pura, it means Virgin Pure, or Angels Can Take Comigo, Angels Sing With Me. And, you know, today maybe not so much anymore, but still the news in Portugal today that families now in winter time, you know, they cannot do so much outside. And what they would do in their houses is to sing and even to compose new hymns. It's very common there that families or even pastors, they compose hymns that then afterwards they are used even in the church. I know when I was in, the, in, in my novitiate in Portugal, there were, was a pastor and he composed his own hymns. And then after approval, he used it in his church. So they have a huge, um, a huge number of beautiful and religious songs. Then, as already mentioned, the children also, they love dancing. And just when they heard maybe uh, other shepherds in the neighborhood 
playing, you know, playing a music instrument, just hearing this to put them into a dance mode. <laughs> Jacinta just loved to dance. She heard music and she started to dance. The children were also ordered to pray the rosary after the lunch. But the whole day seemed too short for their play, singing and dancing. And so they worked out a very smart way in order to get quickly through the rosary. And you probably heard about that. No? So they made a deal. They prayed the rosary. Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. And then it was finished. Our Father, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. So in a twinkling of an eye, they were through the rosary and could be go back to the dancing, singing and playing. Jacinta also loved to hold little light, white lambs tightly in her arms. And she also sometimes, it was very heavy for, the, for her, she carried them home at night on her shoulders. And one day on her way back home, she walked alongside in the middle of the flock. And Jacinta uh, then was asked by Lucia, what are you doing there in the middle of the sheep? And then Jacinda replied, I want to do the same as our Lord in that holy picture that they gave me. He's just like this, right in the middle of them all, and he's holding one of them in his arms. So again, pictures, Bible, what is talked to the, it engraved in their memory. And sometimes it seems they don't, they don't listen or it doesn't help or they're not attentive. It's engraved in the memory later on. It comes to the forefront, they will remember. So we need to teach them, you know, and educate them very well, our kids. Jacinta was very different in character and temperament from Francisco. Francisco had a melancholic, but also a very contemplative, a very profound temperament. Jacinta was more choleric and affectionate. In regards to the spirituality, they were also very different. But here we see also God's providence. Even some things may not equal, but they complement each other perfectly. And so also their spirituality complemented each other perfectly. Francisco was fascinated above all by the fact that they perceived God always so sad in all the apparitions. Also, Our Lady was appearing so sad. And what he wanted to do above all was to have compassion on their pain and to console them by his loving prayers and sacrifices. He took very much to heart the word of the angel during the 1960 apparition when the angel said, console your God. So Francisco would spend all day long Afterwards, after the apparition of Our Lady, consoling his God by making the most of his sacrifices, by constantly praying the rosary, by constantly praying the prayer of the angel of Fatima. He didn't lose any time anymore. Everything to console the good God. Jacinta had a very affectionate heart, and as I mentioned already, she was especially consumed with fright at the thought that so many souls were falling into hell, in the fire of hell. Her mission and desire was to make reparation in every possible way for their sins and obtain the grace of their conversion from the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. He, she was also impregnated by the words of the angel and even more by the words of Our Lady from August 1917. Pray, pray very much and make sacrifices for sinners for many souls go to hell because they have no one to pray and make sacrifices for them. Jacinta wanted to save them from eternal damnation at any price. So where Francisco strived to be the consoler of the hearts of Jesus and Mary, Jacinta was the collaborator to save sinners from hell. Love of God, love of neighbor. Jacinta shared in a profound way in Jesus' thirst when he was hanging on the cross. I thirst is one of the seven words. 
I thirst for your salvation. Lucia remarks in a memoir on Jacinta, Jacinta was the one who received from Our Lady a greater abundance of grace and a better knowledge of God and of virtue. So she was the most favored one, more than Lucia and Francisco. Even Jacinta was the youngest of the three. The Blessed Virgin wished to make Jacinta with a soul so young and delicate, but also so sensitive and courageous, be conformed to Mary's heart. When the cycle of the six great apparitions from May through October 1917 was completed, Jacinda continued almost uninterruptedly to enjoy supernatural graces right up to her, to, until her death. So Our Lady, and maybe other saints and the angel too, we don't know for sure, but Our Lady for sure we know, various times appeared Jacinta alone before she died. Jacinda had a very burning love for the Blessed Mother. From time to time, Jacinda would say to Lucia, Our Lady said that her Immaculate Heart would be your refuge in the road which would, would lead you to God. Don't you love that? As for myself, I love her heart. It is so good. Lucia says in her memoirs, After the month of July, when Our Lady told us in the secret that God wishes to establish in the world devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and that to prevent a future war, she would come to ask for the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart, as well as the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. When we, when we would talk among ourselves, Jacinda would say, I am so sorry I cannot receive communion in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She had also always ejaculatory prayers on her lips constantly and they were taught to her also by the saintly priest Father Cruz. For example, sweetest heart of Mary be my salvation. So this is also important to teach our kids short prayer, prayers, ejaculatory prayers. They often repeat during the day, they make a huge difference and it constantly links them to, uh, to the supernatural life. It's so precious to tell the kids, often say, Jesus, I love you. Mary, I love you. Sweetest heart of Mary, be my salvation. As Jacinta. This is so important. So now we come into the more difficult part. The great message of Our Lady of Fatima is destined for the whole world. But Our Lady willed that this most innocent soul, Jacinda, be penetrated with it and live it with such an intense love that she became, as Sister Lucia says, filled with horror and was led very quickly within a few months to the total gift and sacrifice of her life. I mentioned already that Jacinda was affected the most by the vision of hell and no sacrifice seemed too difficult to offer for the salvation of souls. There were, for example, poor children of families who didn't have much and occasionally they would meet these children when bringing out the sheep to the pasture. As soon as Jacinda saw them, she said, Let's give our lunch to those poor children for the conversion of sinners. And she ran to distribute their lunch. The same afternoon, of course, you know, children, they don't think long term. They just they live in the present moment and they forget they may have hunger afterwards. So she just ran and gave it away. That's how they are. So late, later on in the afternoon, of course, she got very hungry. Instead of eating their lunch from home, the children ate acorns from home oaks and oak trees, which were still very green. Jacinta, for the sake of making an even bigger sacrifice, ate the most bitter ones on the oak trees. And this became one of Jacinta's common sacrifices. And Lucia warned her 
that they were too bitter, Jacinda replied. But it is because it is bitter that I am eating it for the conversion of sinners. The children made the agreement that whenever they saw any poor children, they would give them their lunch. And these poor children, of course, they were only too happy to make sure that they would be just on the way when they would go out and bring their sheep out. Lucia wrote, the children took very good care to meet us. They used to wait for us along, along the road. We no sooner saw them than Jacinda ran to give them all the food we had for that day, as happy as if she had, had no need for it for herself. On days like that, our only nourishment consisted of pine nuts and little berries the size of an olive, which grew on the roots of little bellflowers as well as blackberries, mushrooms, and some other things we found on the roots of pine trees. Jacinda's thirst for making sacrifices was insatiable. Why was it insatiable? Because the first time when it started was already, she understood the value of sacrifice from the angel already. And then of course the pleas of Our Lady. One day, the children were out on a neighbor's pasture. On the way, they gave again their lunch away. It was a very hot, a very blazing day. And they were out of water in this arid, stony wasteland. So they were parched with thirst. The sun was burning down. First, they offered up their thirst courageously. But after midday, they could hold no longer out. So Lucia went to a nearby house and got some water and offered it to Francesco and Jacinta. And she said to Jacinta, you have to drink Jacinta. And Jacinta said, but I want to offer this sacrifice for the conversion of sinners. Francesco said the same. So Lucia poured the water into a hollow on the rock and the sheep could drink it. But that was not the end of the story, of course. Lucia writes, the heat was getting more and more intense. The shrill, the shrill singing of the crickets and grasshoppers coupled with the croaking of the frogs in the neighboring pond made an uproar that was almost unbearable. Jacinda frail as she was and weakened still more by the lack of food and drink said to me with that simplicity which was natural to her, tell the crickets and the frogs to keep quiet. I have such a terrible headache. Then Francisco said to her, don't you want to suffer for the conversion of sinners? And the poor child, clasping her head, head between her little hands, replied, yes, I do, let them sing. Ever since the day the Blessed Mother taught him to offer their sacrifice to Jesus, any time they had something to suffer or agreed to make a sacrifice, Jacinda asked, did you already tell Jesus that it is for love of him? If Lucia said she hadn't, Jacinda answered, then I will tell him. And joining her hands, she raised her eyes to heaven and said, O oh Jesus, it is for love of you, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Again, this one prayer Our Lady taught them. It's an ejaculatory prayer we should use many, many times during our day. In the morning already, Jesus, for love of you, getting up for the conversion of sinners, in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart and the Sacred Heart. When you go on cooking, when you go washing dishes, when you often say this prayer, it has a tremendous value before God. It is given by Our Lady herself. So this should be an ejaculatory prayer constantly on our lips. Jacinda, she is, she is really a great teacher. At the end of October 1918, influenza, the Spanish flu, struck almost the whole world. At that time, uh, I think, some say up to 500 million people died in the world. Some say 100 million. But you know, 
time they were living in when some ways very similar to ours. There was a war, the First World War, 1917, and then right after started this Spanish flu. Also, Jacinda and Francisco were hit by that flu. It was the beginning of their sickness and then also it led to death for them. For both of them, this Spanish flu was the beginning of their sufferings, which would then soon lead him to the supreme sacrifice. And Our Lady told him on the first operation already, she would soon take him home. home. So they knew it. But as it was for Jesus, as it was for Mary, it's for each one of us. Through the cross to the light, through death to life, we must die for this life and we must take up our cross as we heard in the gospel in order to reach the light the heavenly light we should carry our cross actively lovingly willingly with determination I carry my cross not oh I don't like it I hope I can get around and makes you weak and weak and weak you will not be happy not peaceful you're just always concerned uh, to avoid every discomfort. That's not a way how to deal with challenges. Challenges need to be accepted, needs to be, you know, um, taken on and then dealt with. So, the children, they were prepared very well for their end by the angel in 1916 and then by the Blessed Mother in 1917. And they received extraordinary graces. Remember the angel had said in summer 1916, make of everything a sacrifice. Above all, accept and bear with submission the, su the sufferings which the Lord will send you. They took that very much to heart. Also, Our Lady had asked him to offer themselves as victims of reparation. Our Lady told him, Are you willing to offer yourselves to God and bear all the sufferings he will send you in reparation for the sins by which he is offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners? What would you say if Our Lady would ask you that right now? The children said, Yes, we are willing. And then Our Lady foretold them, then you will have much to suffer, but the grace of God will be your comfort. Our Lady kept her word. Francisco and Jacinda were never alone. When they had contracted influenza, the Blessed Virgin came to strengthen them to renew their favor. It was at the end of 1918 or at the beginning of 1919 when Our Lady visited Francisco and Jacinda in their home. They were sick in their beds. And afterwards, Jacinda told Lucia about this visit of the Blessed Mother. Our Lady came to see us. She told us she would come to take Francisco to heaven very soon. And she asked me if I still wanted to convert more sinners. I said I did. She told me I would be going to a hospital where I would suffer a great deal. And that I am to suffer for the conversion of sinners in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and for love of Jesus. I asked if you would go with me. She said you wouldn't, and that is what I find the hardest. She said my mother would take me, and then I would have to stay there all alone. Later on, Jacinda became more precise, and then she told Lucia, now re respectively to this same apparition, our Lady wants me to go to two hospitals, not to be cured, but to suffer more for love of our Lord and for sinners. Now taught by the infused grace which had accompanied the words of the angel, Jacinda had understood the value of sacrifice, how pleasing it is to God, and how in return for it, God converts sinners. She had understood, she was just this was this infused grace with every fiber of her being. She was impregnated with this teaching of the angel. 
She knew the value of sacrifice. If we would know really the value of sacrifice, of suffering, we then offer it up for the salvation of souls, for love of God, we would ask for sufferings. Jacinda gave always a generous yes to the most hardest sacrifices that Our Lady could ever ask her. The greatest fear, the greatest sacrifice for Jacinda was loneliness and to die alone. This was the greatest fear she had. Especially far from her parents and then also far from Lucia. She was very much attached to Lucia. She said to Lucia, the hardest part is to go to the hospital with, without you. But never mind. I'll suffer for love of our law to make reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary for the conversion of sinners and for the Holy Father. And then often she said, when there was something very hard to offer, oh Jesus, now you can convert many sinners because this was really a big sacrifice. Jacinda was really sick and suffered immensely. She had tremendous chest pain, but she would not tell her mother in order to make an extra sacrifice and not to make her mother upset. To Lucia she said, my chest hurts so much, but I am not saying anything to my mother. I want to suffer for our Lord in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary, for the Holy Father, and for the conversion of sinners. When her mother looked sad at, being, at seeing her child so weak and ill, then Jacinta used to say, Don't worry, mother, I am going to heaven. And there I will pray so much for you. In April 1919, when Francisco felt more and more seriously ill and felt his end approaching, Jacinta left him some recommendation for heaven. She said to him, when you go to heaven, give all my love to our Lord and to Our Lady and tell them that I will suffer as much as they want for the conversion of sinners and in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She wished to stay on earth longer, to suffer more, and thus to save a greater number of sinners. There are many other episodes like this, so, but we cannot bring up everything here. On April 4th, 1919, Francisco died. And this separation was very hard for Jacinta. But she also suffered from another separation from Holy Communion. Before her illness, while she was going to school at playtime, she loved to pay a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. Lucia wrote, she liked to be alone for a long time with the hidden Jesus and talk to him. When Lucia came to her bedside, Jacinda asked her, did you receive Holy Communion? And when Lucia said yes, she said, come very close to me. That's the closest she could get to Holy Communion because the priest would not allow her to receive our Lord in Communion. Jacinda was treated in two hospitals, as it was mentioned. First in the ring, it's about 45 minutes walk from Fatima or al where the children had their home. And Jacinda confided to Lucia, the Blessed Mother told me that I'm going to Lisbon to another hospital, that I will not see you again, nor my parents either, and that after suffering a great deal, I shall die alone. But she said, I must not be afraid, since she herself is coming to take me to heaven. Jacinta suffered terribly right up to the day of her departure for Lisbon. Lucia tried to distract her. She told her, don't think about it. What did Jacinta reply? Let me think about it, for the more I think, the more I suffer. And I want to suffer more for love of our Lord and for sinners. Then to regain her courage, she recalled the promise of Our Lady. Soon she would take her to heaven. A 
As soon as Jacinta was, Our Lady wanted her to pass through the dark night, which St. John of the Cross and other saints went through to follow more closely their Christ in his agony. When Jacinta suffered most, she kissed and embraced the crucifix, exclaiming, Oh Jesus, I love you, and I want to suffer very much for love of you. Now you can convert many sinners because this is really a big sacrifice. On January 21st, 1920, finally came, this was the day she had to depart for Lisbon. Before her departure, she visited for the last time the Covada Iria. The first 13 days, she was then in the house of her godmother Godinho. On February 2nd, 1920, she was finally transferred to the hospital. On February 10th, Jacinta was operated. She had her surgery. Because of her extreme weakness, it was impossible to give her chloroform. That's what they used at the time in NATO as an anesthesia. So she only received a local sedating, which was really almost nothing. So what was the operation? During the operation, her side was open and two ribs were taken out. She was totally conscious. And she had a very tiny little body. She was actually very small for her age, the tiny body. And the wound was as large as my hand, about my hand. And they took out her ribs. The only thing she would say during the operation over and over again, oh, Our Lady, patience. We must all suffer to get to heaven. Three days before dying, Jacinda declared, I'm no longer in pain. Our Lady appeared to me again. She told me that she would come to take me soon and that I wouldn't suffer anymore. Dr. Lisboa wrote in his report, so one of the surgeons, as a matter of fact, right after this apparition in the middle of the hospital room, all her sufferings disappeared and she was able to distract herself by looking at pious images, one of which was Our Lady of Samero, which was later offered to me as a souvenir of Jacinta. The child said that this image reminded her the most of the Virgin such as she appeared to her. So Our Lady of Samero, this is a pilgrimage shrine in northern Portugal, and before Fatima, this was the main shrine, the, uh, the primary shrine people of Portugal would, would make a pilgrimage to. So we have also a monastery here in Samero and the other in Fatima, our order. The doctors had great hope for Jacinta's recovery because now she was not so much in, she was not in pain anymore. Jacinda, however, she knew the day and the hour of her death. On the evening of that February 20th, 1920, at about six o'clock, Jacinda wished to receive the sacraments. The parish priest was called and he heard her confession. Jacinda had insisted that the blessed sacrament be brought to her as a viaticum, but the priest did not find it necessary, since she seemed to be fairly well. He promised to bring Holy Communion next morning. Jacinda again asked again, please bring me the Holy Eucharist, saying that she would die shortly, but the priest did not believe her. And indeed, around half past 10 that night, she died peacefully, but alone alone, which was the biggest sacrifice for her. And also not having received our Lord in communion. Everything was accomplished now. The prophecy of Our Lady had been fulfilled. Jacinda died alone, without parents, without friends, without anyone to attend her in her last moments. She was even deprived of the supreme consolation again receive communion. The news spread very fast and soon a sort of pilgrimage in Fatima began. 
So the faithful, if you know the Portuguese people, you know, they come with all their pictures and rosaries and all kinds of things and want to touch the coffin or the corpus of the, you know, of a saint or crucifix or tabernacle or whatever. No, that's not so much. Spanish people, they also, Mexican people also doing this more, but normally others don't do it so much. But this is very common in Portugal. So they brought all their statues, rosaries, in order to touch Jacinta's dress and to pray at her sign. And there are countless witnesses who visited Jacinta before her burial. And just to give you now one report, one witness. I feel as though I can still see this little angel lying in her casket. She seemed to be alive, with her lips and cheeks a beautiful rosy color. I have seen many dead people, young and old, but I have never seen anything like her. The most obstinate unbeliever would not have been able to doubt. Think of the other corpses often give off, which cannot be born without repugnance. Yet a little girl was dead for three and a half days, and the other she exhaled was like a bouquet of various flowers. At that time, they could not refrigerate the bodies. And, yeah. Jacinda was first buried in Villa de Oreng. Then in 1935, the bishop ordered the transfer of Jacinta's body to the cemetery of Fatima. When the coffin was opened, everybody could see that Jacinda's face had remained perfectly intact. I have a picture of her where they just opened the coffin. So it's really, when you look at her in the coffin and you see a picture where she was alive, it's basically the same, perfectly intact. And this after uh, 15 years in the ground, being buried in the ground. On May 1st, 1951, uh, the body was ex again exhumed in order to be transferred to the Basilica in Fatima, where the bodies now, even today, are resting. Now, at this occasion, there could already be seen some decompos decomposition of her body, but you still could somehow recognize this is Jacinta. So thanks be to God, the church has given us this great saint, Francisco as well, for our times, for our children, for our youth. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The children lived during a war, during a pandemic, the Spanish flu, and as I said, many, many people died. They didn't live during a time that was peaceful at all. Their whole life was, most of their life will, lives were lived during war and pandemic. Suffering, a lot of suffering. Portugal was always a target of Freemasonry and communism. So let us ask these two saints in our troubled times that we also may offer our sufferings, our prayers to God, for own sanctification and for the salvation of souls. Let's also take to heart their eagerness, their fervor to save many souls. That we are willing to make many, many sacrifices during the day for love of God, to console God, and to save many sinners. That is all that counts. We don't need to look at our politi politics and the bad cultures already said. We cannot change it. We can try and have committees or diplomacy or whatever. It won't really help. We can get angry. We can get put down, you know, our president who is a president, a Catholic president, but he doesn't really follow the commandments. So do not complain, do not look down to the trash, to all the dirt, to all the negative stuff. The solution is Fatima. Fatima is 100% the solution to overcome our wicked culture, to bring peace to our country. Our Lady and the Angel promised it. And I'm con more convinced than ever, if we Americans, Catholics, lift the message of Fatima, 
this country will be, again be a country under God. And there will be peace. We will overcome Marxism and socialism. We will overcome abortion. We will overcome nah, all this nonsense of transgenderism. But this is where you need to go. And not just in theory, going to a nice conference and being enthusiastic about it, but now in daily life when you leave here, start to do it. Start with a step, and you do it that well, make another step forward, do more, do more, do always more. God always wants you to do more. Never comes the point that you can say, I'm already doing so much, I don't need to do more anymore. God always wants that you do more. Never be content what you have, what you are. So again, let me quote the wonderful words of Jacinta shortly before die, she died. And this is her legacy. Tell the whole world that God gives grace through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that we must ask her for them. Ask her that the heart of Jesus wishes the Immaculate Heart of Mary to be venerated alongside of it, and that it must ask for peace through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, since God has entrusted it to her. If only I could put in all hearts the fire I have in my heart, which makes me burn with so much love for the heart of Jesus and the heart of Mary. Now the end, a poem, Lucia, composed for Jacinta. To Jacinta, swift through the world, you went a-flying, dearest Jacinta, in deepest suffering, Jesus loving. Forget not my plea in a prayer to you. Be ever my friend before the throne of the Virgin Mary, lily of candor, shining pearl. Up there in heaven, you live in glory, seraphim of love, with your little brother Francisco at a mother's feet, pray for me. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your attention and patience. It was an hour, so you did well. You're welcome. So you can turn off. So, um, as is already announced, uh, our order also, as the apostolate of the Opus Sanctorum and Shalom, we promote in the church consecration to the guardian angel and even all the angels. And the crown of all this is consecration of expiation in the spirit of Fatima, of course. But not everybody needs to go through all this. So what I think is almost for everybody, if you have a devotion to the guardian angel and you want really to grow in the spiritual life, I think then everybody, if you have this desire, then you can apply for the consecration of the guardian angel. Now, the Holy See always wants that people do that with preparation in order, to, in order that this consecration bears fruit. You need to know what you are doing about and also learn and live it out already. And then the more you collaborate with the grace of the consecration, the more it will bear fruit in your life. So therefore, there's a formation here involved. And yeah, I should tell you a little bit about, no, I don't think I do that still. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so what do the angels for us? That's basically what I think. Do you have already a, a, a devotion to the angels, those who are interested? So I don't think I need to do that. Um, yeah, let's say this way. After the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart, the angels have a key role in every human's life. In every human's life. And therefore, we, if you want to make progress in the spiritual life, then a very good way to get great help is to make a consecration to the Sacred Heart, Immaculate Heart, to the Blessed Mother in general, and then to the angels, because they have key role in the, in the economy of grace, in the sanctification of souls for every human being. You cannot say the, uh, the same of a saint, you know. 
You can have a special devotion to St. Lucy or St. Benedict or whatever. I have a devotion, a little flower, you know, and, you know, and to Our Lady, everybody, of course. Uh, with the angels, it's different because the angels have a key role in everybody's life. And as the Catechism says, besides each believer sends an angel, a shepherd and protector, leading him to life. Without the angels, the simply the economy of grace, set by God, that's the rule, as Thomas Aquinas says, without the help of the angels, none of us could go to heaven. And therefore, everyone has a personal guardian angel. So there's only now a fraction what I should tell you, but I think it's enough in order to motivate you if this is your call. So if you would like to apply for this formation, the one-year formation, you can come out, I give you the application, you fill it out and give it back to me, and then you receive the formation book, and you can do this formation on your own, at home. There are 12 formation letters, or you can also, when you do it, you know each other, you can also have meetings, monthly meetings, and then do it together. That is very helpful for most people. But not everybody has this opportunity because he lives at a distance from uh, someone else. So if you like to do this, you can fill out the application, receive the formation package, and what we ask is that you make a donation of $20. It's not a membership fee or so, it's only to help cover the cost for the formation program. So it's for the materials, but also other things that cost us for the formation program, also traveling sometimes. What else? So this is only the application for the formation. So now you study and you learn and you grow, you pray, you discern for 12 months. And then after 10 months, 9 months, 10 months, you could already apply for the actual consecration when you feel ready. The most important for this formation is not so much that you memorize everything in the formation book, but that you actually translate it. So what you learn now, it becomes part in your life. Otherwise, the consecration cannot really be efficient in your life. So implementation, because there's simply a principle in regards to the distribution of grace. You need to collaborate. If you want more grace, you need to collaborate more. If you want even more grace, you need to collaborate even more. The more you want to receive, the more you need to collaborate. That means the more you need to detach yourself from the world, the more you need to pray, the more you need to practice virtue, the more you need, you know, make acts of love and sacrifices for love of God and neighbor. There's no other way. If you want to be holy, you need to live the life of a saint. It's not enough to say, Lord, make me holy. So many people do. And it's not something automatic. It needs a collaboration. It needs sacrifice, self-denial, which is at times very hard. But with the special help of our angel and the Blessed Mother, it is still hard, but it becomes much easier. And we go much more efficient forward in our way of sanctification. So the Blessed Mother and our angel, they are the best helps in order to grow in the understanding of our faith, in, in discernment, in acquiring greater knowledge, deeper knowledge of the mysteries of our faith, let's say this way. Because the more we have a friendship with them, the more we open ourselves more to the Blessed Mother and our angels, the more we participate and share in their wisdom, in their holiness, in their virtues. Does this make sense? You open yourself like a kid. If a kid is completely open to the mother and, and just soaks in every, everything what the mother says, the kid profits tremendously. The kid does not listen to the mother, it stays alone and will be spoiled or selfish or whatever. So the more we open ourselves, our heart, and we do that all the more through a consecration, which is approved by the church, sanctioned by the church. So then the angel has more influence on my life and can lead me more effectively to God. There's in a few sentences why we make a consecration to the Blessed Mother, Sacred Heart, and to our angel. So thank you again for listening, and if you would like to apply, please meet me outside.